Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. The Bible says we overcome evil with good and so I believe that we can drive all bad habits out of our life by simply focusing on making good habits. So that's what we're doing. We're focusing on the good, believing that it will drive out the bad things in our life. The Bible says if you will walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Look away from all that distracts unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. A habit is something that we do very often without even realizing that we do it. And it's done because we've done that thing repetitiously so often that it's gotten ingrained in us and become a habit. They say that as much as 40% of everything that we do can be done strictly out of habit, which in a way is kind of scary. If they're good habits, that's great. But if they're not, it's kind of freaky to think you can be doing all these things and don't even know you're doing them. So far, what we've talked about, of course, is laying a foundation about habits, and then we've talked about having the God habit. The number one most important habit is that we spend regular quality fellowship time with God and that we learn His Word. The habit of thoughts and words and how our thoughts and words do affect our habits. The habit of being decisive, healthy habits, the happy habit. The habit of faith, the habit of excellence. Did you enjoy that one last night? The habit of excellence. The habit of being responsible, the habit of generosity. And we have five left for this morning, and we will do them all. I'll spend more time on some than the others. This morning, I'm going to talk about the hurry habit, emotional habits, the confidence habit, the habit of adding value to others, and the habit of discipline. And I know you can all hardly wait for me to get to that one. Amen? <laughs> now, everybody, it seems like, is in a hurry, but a lot of people don't even know where they're going. And I like what one man said, Soren Kierkegaard, most men pursue pleasure with such breathless, breathless haste that they hurry right past it. And that's true. We're so busy trying to enjoy our lives and working so we can have things that we can enjoy, and yet most of the time we're too busy to enjoy any of it. And so you can hurry on the outside, but you can also hurry on the inside. And I actually think that when you're in a rush all the time in your soul, that that does a lot more damage to us than what we can ever imagine. Now, I have lots of experience with hurrying because I have a lot of things that I'm doing, a lot of things I'm responsible for, and I'm a pretty quick person anyway. And so I've had to really work in this area. And I'm still letting God teach me in this area. But how many of you would say that you're pretty fed up with hurrying at this point in your life? All right. So we need to break the hurry habit. My husband's mom had, she raised all the kids, eight, right? Eight children. And Dave's dad died when he was 16. So they still had lots of young kids at home. And They didn't have much money, and she cleaned homes for people, and just she was just very, very busy. And so she just hurried all the time, just hurried all the time. Well, after all of her kids were gone, and she was up in her 70s, and she was living with one of her other kids. I was over there one day, and she was making me some coffee, and I noticed that she was just running from thing to thing to thing in the kitchen. And I said, why are you in such a hurry? She said, oh, I don't know. That's just... That's just a habit I've got. And so sometimes we get in such a hurry that we, it becomes such a part of us that we don't even stop to think that we don't have to live that way. And I'm just encouraging you to make a decision today that you're going to calm down, enjoy the trip, enjoy the journey, take the time to enjoy some of the things that you've worked so hard to attain in your life. If you have a beautiful home, take the time to enjoy it. If you have children, take the time to enjoy them. The Bible even says that a woman is to enjoy her husband. Take the time to enjoy your husband. Amen? The men are all over that. And uh, 
I know this is not in the Bible, but I'll just take a little license this morning and say, and men should be very good to their wives. They should help them, and enjoy them, and do all kinds of things for them, and give them, you know, lots of hugs and smiles and tell them they're beautiful. That, that's got to be in there somewhere. I just haven't, haven't found it just in those words yet. But seriously, Jesus paid such a price for us to have a great life. And to just never take the time to enjoy it is really pretty tragic. And you know, God's not in a hurry. Has anybody noticed that? God's not in a hurry. I mean, can you really imagine Jesus with the disciples saying, come on, guys, get up, get up. We got to go. Let's get on. We, we got to get on over here and get this next meeting done. Hurry up. Get that mess cleaned up. Let's go. Let's go. I mean, sure, it's laughable when we think about that because when we think of Jesus, he's the perfect picture of calm and peace. You know why God doesn't hurry? Because he's more interested in quality than quantity. And that's something that we have lost sight of in the world today. It's very difficult to even get a quality product made, a quality home built, a quality job done when you have somebody come out to repair something. Why? Matter of fact, it's even difficult to get them to show up on time or sometimes to show up at all. And you know why that is? Because everybody's trying to make so much money that they're all so busy that they can't get it all done. And so we've traded quality for quantity and we're less happy than we've ever been as a whole in any time in history. So having more does not have the ability to make you happy. It would be better to have a few nice things, really nice things, than to have a whole house full of junk. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Paul is giving his son Timothy, his spiritual son Timothy, instructions about the ministry. As for you, be calm and cool and steady. <laughs> I'm talking to you this morning. Be calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship. So he's even saying, and when things get rough, stay calm and cool and steady. You know why? When you lose your peace, you lose your power. But as long as you hang on to your peace, you can continue to be led by the Spirit. It's not going to wear you out. God will show you what to do, and you'll be the one that's in the front and in the lead. Be calm, cool, and steady. Suffer every hardship unflinchingly. Do the work of an evangelist. Fully perform all the duties of your ministry. 1 Peter 3, 11. Yeah, I'm a pretty per peaceful person now. I would say that most of the time I'm just pretty peaceful. That doesn't mean that I can't get upset or that I don't still see a little temper flare once in a while. But I'm a pretty peaceful person. And you know why? Because about 15 years ago, I decided that if it was the last thing I ever did, I was going to learn how to live in peace. Amen. Because I had spent a large majority of my life frustrated and upset. And I found this scripture, and it really taught me a lot. Let him, this is him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, is what verse 10 says. So if you want to enjoy life and see good days, let him turn away from wickedness and shun it. Let him do right. Let him search for peace. Everybody say, search for peace. Harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts, and let him seek it eagerly. So we have to search for peace, and we have to seek it eagerly. Then it goes on to say, peace with God, peace with yourself, and peace with your fellow man. So let me just throw this out, because I always have to get this foundation in. If you're not at peace with yourself, then you're not going to find peace no matter what you do in any area of life. So the first thing you got to do is decide, okay, I'm not perfect. God knew that when he got me. I don't have to be mad at myself. I don't have to be in a war with myself because I make mistakes. I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm growing. Amen? And you can enjoy yourself while you're changing. And if you don't learn how to enjoy yourself, you're not going to learn how to enjoy anything else that you do. You know why? Because everywhere you go, you're there. So no matter what you're doing, if you don't enjoy yourself, you're going to run into yourself everywhere you're at. And you're going to be miserable. So we really need 
to stop all this hurrying and frustration and upset. And I want you to form a habit of being peace, of being peaceful. I'm talking about breaking the hurry habit, but I really could have called it form the peace habit. I'm at the point now, and I know that many of you have reached this point too. My husband was born this way, but I wasn't. I had to catch up. Where the minute that I start to get upset, that's like my alarm clock to change something. I can't do it anymore. It's too hard on you to be upset. It takes too much of your strength and energy and power to be frustrated. And to hurry all day long just absolutely will wear you out. It just will wear you out. Hurrying is one of the major sources of a loss of peace and unpleasant display of emotions. If you want peace, how many of you want more peace? You sure? All right. If you want it, then you have to be willing to make the changes that you will need to make to get it. Not as interested in that, I guess, huh? You can't keep doing the same thing and expect to get a different result. I said you can't keep doing the same thing and expecting to get a different result. You say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm praying. I'm waiting for God to do something. You know what God will do? God will show you what to do, and he'll help you do it. We miss that. We always want to live, you know, crazy and then expect God to come in and wipe away all the results of the way that we've lived. But you have to change things if you want to have peace. You've got to start saying no to some people. You've got to start getting some things out of your schedule. You got to start doing what's really going to bear fruit in your life. You know, there's no place in the Bible where it says that God has called us to be busy. We're called to be fruitful, bear good fruit. Matter of fact, I think we ought to look at busy like a new four letter word. I get pretty tired of seeing people. How have you been, brother? Busy. How are you? Busy. How have you been? Busy. You know, if that's all we've got to say for ourselves, that's pretty sad. So I don't even like it when people say to me, oh, I bet you're busy. I say, no, you know what? I prefer to say I'm fruitful. I don't want to just feel that I'm busy all the time. I, you know, yes, I, I, I'm doing a lot, but I feel like that what I'm doing is helping people, and I believe that I can do it at a pace where I can have sanity and where I can enjoy what I'm doing. Amen. I bet if you thought about it for even five minutes, you could come up with two or three things that you could easily cut out of your life, never miss them, that would add more peace to you right away and make some room in your schedule. How many of you think that's possible? That you're probably, see there? Now look, you already know it. So what's stopping you? I don't know. Most people say they're too busy, but very few are willing to change anything. They don't want to give up any of the things that create their too busy lifestyle. You know, when people die and you see their tombstone, <clears throat> it's like Susie Brown, born 1954, dash, died. 2005. I think maybe that dash is saying something to us. Is that all we do is dash through life? Born here, dash, and now we're dead? What's going to be involved in the dash on your tombstone? Can you say, yep, that's what I did, just dash through life? Uh-uh. I'm going to enjoy mine. I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. I'm enjoying preaching to you. And I'm going to enjoy it when I'm done. I'm going to enjoy going out with my husband to eat. I'm going to enjoy whatever I do. I'm going to enjoy going home. I'm going to enjoy getting up in the morning. You know why Jesus died that we might have and enjoy our life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. <clears throat> in Matthew 25, 5, we see that when the, the virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, to come while the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming. <laughs> slow. Jesus was slow in coming. They all began nodding their heads and they fell asleep. Well, you know, sadly, sometimes because God is slow, people give up. 
But you got to understand that God takes his time because what he's making is not going to be junk. And he'd rather do what he's doing right than to do something quick and it not be what's going to really meet the need. And not only that, God is working in you and he's working in me. And I don't know about you, but it took God a lot of time to get me to the point where he could use me. Amen. Wonderful scriptures and just all over the Bible. Psalm 86, 15, God is abundant in mercy and slow to anger. Proverbs 14, 29, he who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is hasty of spirit exposes and exalts his folly. You know, we should be slow to anger and quick to forgive. We should be the kind of people where it is almost impossible to get us upset. Not the kind of people that the minute something doesn't go our way, we're all tense inside and all upset about it. I want to have peace. Set an overload alarm. Some way for you to know, now wait a minute, I'm starting to feel pressured so something's wrong. You can feel it when you're about to lose your peace. How many of you can feel it when it's on its way? You don't even have to wait till it's arrived. You can feel it when it's on its way. Well, I can't help the way I feel. Yes, you can. You may not be able to help the way you feel initially, but you can control your behavior. And if you do that, your feelings will calm down. But if you feel something and you give into it, then you feed it and the feeling just gets worse and worse and worse. When you feel it, if you don't feed it, you'll starve it and it will calm down and go away. I was thinking about, you know, I'm not that big of a sports person, but I do, I can understand baseball fairly well. And, um, you know, the umpires seem to have an awful lot of authority. And sometimes they can be a little bit aggravating because even if they make what appears to be a bad call, everybody still has to pay attention to it. So the umpire has a, a major part in a ball game. Well, do you know in Colossians 3.15, the Bible says that we are to let the peace of God rule as an umpire in our lives. An umpire says what's in and what's out what's fair and what's foul. And so if I have peace, then that means that I'm in God's rhythm. You know, God has a rhythm and it's different than our rhythm. And we need to learn how to get in God's rhythm and stay in the pace that God would be in so we can enjoy the life that he died to give us. Peace is the only way to do that. If you don't have peace about something, don't do it. If you're doing so much that all of a sudden you're starting to lose your peace, then look around and see what you can cut out. I would like to give you some magical answer for this. I would like to pray some prayer over you that would automatically cause you to never hurry again. But I'm telling you, the only way that you're ever going to change it is if you look at your life and you see what can be changed and you make the changes that you can make in order to have peace. And you won't do it if peace is not valuable enough to you in order for you to do it. So if you're not ready to do it now, the only thing I can say is go ahead, spend another two or three years being frustrated and miserable, and then maybe I'll come back and preach the same message, or you'll get it on TV, and you'll get it then. But that's the only answer. I cannot wave a magic wand over you and give you peace. That's why I loved it when I saw that scripture that said, seek peace and pursue it. Well, I'm praying for peace. Well, you might as well just stop, because the Bible says that he has given us his peace. We have peace. It is resident in our spirit. It is one of the fruit of the spirit, but we have to learn how to let it come out and guide our lives. We have to le learn to let it be an umpire in our lives. Amen. It's even harmful to our health if we're hurrying all the time. I just can't stand it anymore. And for me, as soon as I start to hurry, you know what happens? I usually start acting kind of bad. I got any relatives out there? And you know what? The devil sets you up to get you upset. One of my favorite statements, he sets you up to get you upset. He knows what buttons to push, and one of mine is put me in a position where I have to hurry. And if I do, um, I can still be a little mouthy. And I can still start blaming. 
and then I might need to read my book on healthy habits. <laughs> Get your day started right. If you have the hurry habit and you want to break it, start by getting up early enough that you won't have to begin the day hurrying. How about doing some things the night before? Why don't you decide the night before what you're going to wear and maybe make some of the lunches the night before and, you know, get some of the stuff done the night before so when you get up you don't have 25 things to do that's then surely going to push you over the edge. Look at your schedule or your plans for each day. And if you know that you cannot realistically do everything that you've got planned, come on, which is probably most days for most of you, then take something out of it, move it to the next day, or see if it's something that you could just simply not do at all and pursue peace. Confess several times a day. I move in God's rhythm, I hold my peace, and I enjoy my life. And remember, to focus on peace, and it will begin to get bigger and bigger in your life. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell, rejoice. Be strengthened, perfected, completed, and made what you ought to be. Be encouraged and consoled and comforted. Be of the same agreeable mind, one with another. Live in peace. And then the God of love, who is the source of affection, goodwill, and love, and benevolence toward men, and the author and the promoter of peace will be with you. Let me share something with you. When you feel peace, that's God's presence. He is the Prince of Peace. God is love. When you feel real love flowing to you or through you, that's God. That's not something that people come up with. Peace. When you feel peace, you are in the presence of God. Stay in God's rhythm. Don't be in the rhythm that the world's in. Emotional habits. We could probably spend a little bit of time there, right? <laughs> Some emotional habits that are harmful are self-pity. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Depression. Excessive discouragement or grief. Letting our circumstances determine our mood. <laughs> a quick temper. Being touchy and easily offended. Taking action based on emotion without being realistic and giving in any thought to what we're doing. If our plans don't work, we feel sorry for ourselves. I used to spend a lot of time feeling sorry for myself, and any time God had tried to deal with me about it, I'd say, well, you know, I was abused, and I was treated like a dog. Nobody should have been treated the way I was, and I finally understood that, I mean, that was true. I wasn't treated right. And I had a reason to sit around and be mad and angry and have a chip on my shoulder and all kinds of stuff, but I had no right to because Jesus died, so I didn't have to. Come on, let's get that again now. It's not about what you have a reason to do. I'm saying that because Jesus poured his blood out for us and sacrificed his life and suffered the way that he did on the cross and went to hell in our place, and, and thankfully he was resurrected and is now at the right hand of the Father. But everything that he, can you imagine what it was like for God to come down here and get in a fleshly body? That would be like me agreeing to go be an ant. And even that is not a good example. He did so much for us. So much for us. And we don't have to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, you may have a reason, but you don't have a right to because he paid too high of a price for you not to have to. So, I guess I might as well say this. If you do it, it's not because you have to, it's because you want to.
I'm going to find a few people that are smiling at me and, well, I know how it goes. Well, you, just, you don't know what I'm going through. You, you know what my life's been like. I'm just telling you that self-pity is not going to help you. It's not going to change anything. It doesn't impress God. It doesn't move God. Oh, the devil loves it. Oh, yeah. Every time you spend a day in self-pity, hell has a party. They, they, they love it. You know, you need to get to the point where when the devil invites you to a pity party, you say, no thanks, been there, done that, not wasting another day of my life sitting somewhere feeling sorry for myself. Galatians 5.16 says, but I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh. So I just want to encourage you that while you're farming new habits, it's important for you to stay positive and think about the good thing that you're trying to do instead of thinking about the bad habit that you're trying to break. We always have a tendency to focus on, I need to break this habit, I need to break this habit. But really what we should do is focus on the good thing that God is working in us. Be thankful, God, I thank you that you're working in me. Thank you that you're working this good thing in me and the good will force out the bad. om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan en om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen, onze kinderen. Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maak een geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long and come so far upon this road and we've seen mountain high valley low we will battle on
hulp van al die mensen wereldwijd die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden?